Good afternoon. We are in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Before we get started, how about blessings you'd like to share with your church family? Do you have blessings you'd like to share with your church family? Yes, Norm. Yes. Yeah, excellent. Other blessings? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we had a great turnout for the Color Run training, which will be this week. I was surprised to see, but delighted to see. You know, the local paper puts out an events calendar every two weeks. The number one event to do is a color run at Central United Protestant Church. Yes. All right. Other blessings. And that is a blessing, yes. Yes, ma'am. First great-grandchild, well, congratulations. Our own Mr. Chris Garza is expecting at any moment a, another grandchild, a baby boy. Other blessings. All right, how about prayer concerns? Things in your life, people in your life, things in our world you'd like for us to pray about. Yes, sir. We will continue to remember her. A cornea transplant. Others. Yes, ma'am. Andy Hesser, yes, and that will be an ongoing concern. Others? Yes, ma'am. The knees are having problems at this moment. Okay, we will remember them. Others, others, others. I know there are a lot of requests among us. A lot of things we need to remember in prayer. One of the great things is God hears what we do not say. And even those things we don't have words for. So let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for the knowledge that you hear us when we pray. Whether those prayers are out loud or those prayers are silent, or we have no words for our prayers. You hear our hearts. We lift them to you. And Lord, we pray also for our time together. We pray that uh, we would learn from your word, learn from the example of your people, and that we would put this into practice. In Christ's name, amen. Okay. We are uh, um, in First Thessalonians. Uh, this, the introduction to First Thessalonians is rel relatively brief. The first chapter is only 10 verses. And one thing I have learned from 40-something years of ministry is when you run out of stuff to say, you turn off the sound. So, this could be a relatively brief lesson, but I encourage you, if you do have a questions, we definitely have time to address them today. Thessalonians is unique among New Testament books in as much as it was probably the very first New Testament book written. 
And 2 Thessalonians was written about six months after 1 Thessalonians. So it was probably, it was most definitely the first of Paul's letters that was, became a part of the Bible. And we believe that his letters were written before the Gospels were written, or at least part of his letters were. So this is the very first one, probably 51, 52 A.D., written from Corinth. Um, there has been very little debate as to whether Paul wrote it or not. Most people believe that he wrote it. And there were sources as early as 140 A.D., uh, less than 100 years after it was written, that said Paul was the author. Thessalonica, the town of Thessalonica, was a seaport town. Uh, it was the largest city in Macedonia. Still is. Okay? Still is. Um... Paul began his ministry there in the Jewish synagogue, so it's reasonable to uh, assume that there were Jewish Christians in the church at Thessalonica. However, most of the Christians at Thessalonica were Gentiles. Um, the Jewish community, as often happened in Paul's dealings with them, uh, rejected him. He came under severe persecution and had to leave in the middle of the night. Um, so, and that was that's another pattern that happened. Paul almost always, in fact, I cannot think of a time that when he went into an area, if there was a Jewish synagogue, that's where he started. But if he was going to have trouble in a given city, it generally came from the Jewish folks in that city. And that's what happened at Thessalonica. He and Silas had to leave in the middle of the night. He left very abruptly. Paul writes the letter to the church at Thessalonica for three purposes. The first one is to encourage them in their trials and persecution. Uh, when he left... He left the persecution behind, but they stayed and were persecuted rather severely. These mostly Gentile uh, Christians were coming out of uh, paganism and had to learn what it meant to follow Yahweh God and to be a Christ follower. So he wrote it also to teach them how to live in a godly fashion. Also, the church at Thessalonica had a very urgent question. Paul, at this time of his life, believed that he would see with his own eyes the second coming of Christ. He believed that. That's how he taught. That's how he talked. The question at Thessalonica was, what happens to people who die before Jesus returns? And Paul is going to address that in, in this chapter, in this book. In fact, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians has something to say about the second coming of Christ. So some might conclude that the second coming seems to be uh, the major reason for the letter, at least in time things. Okay, that is the introduction, introduction to 1 Thessalonians. You got questions or observations, something you would like to add? Okay, let us begin then. Paul's standard salutation, his standard, excuse me, standard greeting. 
Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Uh, when, just a reminder, when he says Paul, Timoth Paul, Silas, and Timothy, doesn't mean that they uh, authored it together. Paul is a writer, but Silas and Timothy are there with him, with him, helping him in the work. To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, most of Paul's letters, letters were written to churches, but they aren't churches as, well, they are churches as we think of churches, but they were different than churches as we think of churches. Most of them were house churches, and there would have been many of them. The church at Thessalonica, it would have been all the little house churches in Thessalonica. In the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, grace and peace to you. Grace, God's unmerited favor bestowed upon the undeserving. And peace. Peace that passes all understanding. And that for which is for your greatest good. Grace and peace. Verse 2, and since we have such a brief chapter today, I'm going to go through this. Instead of doing a section at a time, I'm going to go through this verse by verse. Verse 2, this is a very common theme in all of Paul's letters. He almost always begins by saying, I'm praying for you and I thank God for you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. Always thank God for you, mentioning you in, uh, my, in our prayers. Um, one of the characteristics of the early church is that they were a praying church. They prayed constantly, they prayed individually, and they prayed together. Incidentally, one of the things that I hope that we can get going again very soon is our prayer warriors, uh, people who will come together at regular intervals and pray for our church. This church is blessed with a couple of very nice uh, areas designated for prayer. How many of you know that we have a prayer garden? Not all of you do, do you? We have a prayer garden. You've worked on it, yeah. <laughs> and we have a prayer room. Did you know that? Okay, more of you know that we have a prayer room than we have a prayer garden. But we have both a prayer room and a prayer garden. And we are working on the prayer room to get it updated, are we not? Church Hands of Christ, yep. And the, head, the uh, prayer garden has been uh, cleaned, updated, planted, and is in good shape. Uh, I want to, uh, I, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, um, one of the things that I find strange about our prayer garden is it's very hard to get in our prayer garden. And, and we're going to work on that. It's, yeah, it's even harder to get out. You get in and you lock the, you put, let the door close behind you. You can't get out, out if you don't have a key. So... We're, 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 we're going to, I don't know what that symbolizes. I don't know what that's, I don't know what that says. I, we're, we're going to work on that. Uh, I'll get to you in a minute, Norm. Uh, I, I had a, my, my first church in Idaho. Um, how do I want to say this? Um, 
In the Oregon Idaho Conference, there were two brothers back during the uh, late 40s, early 50s who competed. They were pastors, and they competed with each other. One of them was in Oregon, and the other one was in Idaho. And they both built these large, were very successful pastors. They built these large churches. The one in Oregon built the church Caldwell, and it is built to the dimensions of, of an upside-down ark. My comment on that was, I don't know what it means when your ark is upside down. My, my first thought was, when I saw it was, I wonder how much hay this thing would hold. Because it looks like a barn. <laughs> so I don't know what it says when you can't get into the prayer garden. Okay. Paul says... We always pray for you, mention you always in our prayers. We continually remember before God and before God, our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your work produced by faith, you work because of your faith. Your labor prompted by love, motivated by love. And the Christian is to be motivated by love all the time. And your endurance inspired by hope. Can do all things because of the hope that is in us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Norm, what were you going to say to us? Oh, you can't go out by going outside. You can go outside, but you can't come back inside. Okay. I did know that. It doesn't work very well. The gate doesn't work very well. Work very well. That sounds like experience. <laughs> During, did y'all, since we got some time, did y'all know that you had a duck in the prayer garden during the pandemic who raised little ones? She hatched little ones, and they had to get her out through the gate in there. Anyway, anyway. yeah. But you notice in this verse, there is the, the formula that you see in, throughout the New Testament. Faith, hope, and love. Your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. All right, moving on. Verse 4. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction that God has chosen you. Now, um, if you come from a Presbyterian background, you say that that is, that is uh, predestination. If you come from a Wesleyan background, you say God has chosen everyone. God chooses everyone, but we must choose God back. Chose that you are chosen, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Uh, Aaron and I had a conversation today at lunch, and one of the things that I, I that I was I was telling him, and and uh, it's one of my one of my uh, uh, things that inspires my ministry and inspires my life is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Now, you've heard, you've heard that before. I've said it and other people have said it. The key is being able to communicate you care. Because you can say that all you want. But you must be able to communicate it in other ways. It's not just about 
mouthing the words. People must genuinely believe that you do care. Paul said this message came to you not just simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. And that was proven out in the way they lived among this. You're going to see this later on when Paul says, you know, we, we had a right to expect you to take care of us while we were there. But we wanted to set an example for you. Therefore, we worked ourselves to provide for our own needs so that you wouldn't have to. The reason we did that is so that we could set an example for you of how you should live. For you know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction. Conviction, You know how we lived among you for your sake. You know how we lived among you for your sake. We did what we did to set an example. Um, I think I've shared with this group before, but if I haven't, let me share it again. There was a gentleman in my second Baptist church by the name of Algie Dunkley. And uh, we called him Brother Algie. Uh, and I, was, I had been at that church for over a year when I found out that Mr. Algie had never heard a sermon I preached. He could not hear a jet engine. Um, he couldn't hear. But he was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Every time the doors were open, Brother Algie was there. And one day I, I said, uh, Brother Algie, I am, so, I, I am so blown away by your dedication, but I, I cannot, I, I, I cannot, I can't understand why you're here so faithfully when you can't hear anything. And I'll never forget his response. His response is, I am setting an example for these young people. This is what you're supposed to do. I'm setting an example. He couldn't hear. Um, I took that to heart, and uh, within six months, we got us a new sound system. Now, this is back in the old days. It wasn't like the, the wireless stuff that we have today, but we had a way of <coughs> getting, a, micro, getting a, a headset for him that he had, had the, the power, the, the volume control on the headset, and he could plug directly into our new sound system and turn that sucker up as loud as he wanted to. And I, I remember the first time we did that, he, we, 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 he was sitting in the back by the sound system, and he had it on, and I said, Mr. Algy, can you hear me? And he went, He says, Paul says, you know, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In, so, in spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know how we lived among you? You became imitators of us. And you'll hear Paul saying that again and again and again. I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Other Half of Church. And it has to do with uh, um, neuroscience and religion. Most of the Christian faith, most of the Christian church, is geared toward left brain geared toward learning, geared toward uh, 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 
accepting knowledge. And we don't deal a lot with, with the right brain. And the right brain learns from watching and imitating. And it's been fascinating for me as I, as I read this book and I read and I think about Paul's writings, how often he talked about imitating me as I imitate Christ. And the right brain learns by imitation, learns by watching, and it is a lot faster than the left brain. The left brain is very slow compared to the right brain. So by the time, if, if you have seen good imitation on how to respond to something in an in a, um, adverse situation, your right brain has already made a decision before your left brain goes, what should we do? The right brain has already made that decision. And that comes by... That comes by imitation. And as I'm reading this book and I'm thinking about how many times Paul said, imitate me as I imitate the Lord, is, uh, is, is watch, watch what, it, see what it looks like. Uh, and one of the things I read, I happened to read this morning actually, um, one of the things we do as, a, as churches is we have a tendency to separate people based on age, don't we? Think about it. We have this age group with this age group with this age group. Uh, and one of the things that this author was bemoaning is that our young people don't have a lot of opportunity to imitate you, our older folks in our congregations, because we're not around one another that much. But how much they could learn from us, imitate what it looks like for a mature Christian to handle difficult situation. Something to think about, something I'm thinking about. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In, in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. In spite of what you went through, you welcomed the message with joy. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaea, the Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Archaea, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Probably a little bit of a stretch that your faith has become known everywhere, but what Paul is trying to say is you're setting a good example. You're setting a good example, and people are taking notes. People are, are taking notes. Um, that's humbling to think that people are watching, people are taking notes, and people are uh, are, are, are are watching. I am. Um, I am. Very proud of the fact that uh, we were mentioned locally uh, in, in, with a local newspaper. I'm, that people are watching Central. I uh, found out that there are going to be at least uh, two news groups here for the Saturday event. Uh, it looks very promising. This is not a done deal, but it looks very promising that we're going to have a farmer's market here on Saturdays. And the community is going to be coming through here every Saturday. And we're going to have a booth out there advertising our church 
and what's going on here at our church and what you can get involved in in the Bible in the Bible studies and in Alpha and Grief Share and all those kinds of things and what we're doing with with Martha's cupboard how we're reaching out to the community so I'm I'm I am I'm excited about I'm excited about that, and I want you to be excited about that. And that we are going to be able, we're going to be able to put our best foot forward and put our best face forward. So let's do that. Yes, ma'am. I read in message about Ah, did you hear that, Aaron? Guess what's going to happen? We're going to talk about what Alpha is. Because we, we, we churchy folks have a bad habit of that, don't we? We use terms like VBS. Now, y'all know what VBS is. But if you haven't been around church, do you know what VBS is? Do you know what Alpha is? Oh, so... It's the beginning of, the beginning of something, yeah. We'll see what it's the beginning of. Okay. Anyway. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. What, about what? About their faith. Because everybody knows. They have, a great, they have a great reputation. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. You welcomed us with open arms in spite of the prospects of being persecuted. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living God, the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath, from the coming wrath. Okay. This is a, this is a marks of the Christian life. Turn from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son, the second coming. Turn from idols, serve God, wait for his son, believe in the second coming. And this is where Paul mentions the second coming in chapter 1. Well, save us from wrath. Um, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. There's different ways of interpreting the coming wrath. There are some who believe the coming wrath is the final judgment. Others who believe the coming wrath is further persecution of the church. Okay, I told you it was a short chapter. That's about all I can drag out of it. So it's time for me to turn off the sound. Do you have a question? I do have a couple of funnies. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Am I going to explain what Alpha is? Okay. I will, I will explain what Alpha is. Think of Alpha as a systematic explanation of the Christian faith. It is designed to be a place for mature Christians to come if they would like to. You know, with, with, with coming to church, if you come to church, often you get, a, you get a snippet here and a snippet here and a snippet over here. This kind of gives it a system, a, a, a logical pattern, if you will, of looking at the Christian faith. But Alpha was is is for people who have questions about the Christian faith. It's not necessarily for Christians. It is people, it is definitely for, you would feel very comfortable there and feel a part there, and you, if you've never taken it, you should take it. But it is designed for people who have questions about the Christian faith out in the community to come to church Take this class, watch the videos, hear the lectures, and be in a non-judgmental place where they can ask all kind of questions. 
That's what it's designed for. And it's designed for Christians who want to explore their faith more, more thoroughly. Um, I, I almost used this illustration this past Sunday, and God wouldn't let me, but he's given me an opportunity to do it now. You opened up the door, so I'm going to do it. Um, you know, when people come into the church, we assume that they know a little bit, but sometimes they don't. Uh, we, had a, we had a couple come to our church, my last congregation, uh, mom and dad hadn't ever been to church. They'd been, you know, they'd been in the community. They heard about church, but they decided that they would come to church, and they did. And they they had a, an eight-year-old son or nine, eight or nine-year-old son and like a five-year-old daughter. And um, they were learning about the Christian faith and about church. So they were at their first Easter. And you know, Easter... You don't preach about Christmas on each Easter. It's always, it's always about the resurrection. We talk about the empty tomb, Jesus being raised from the dead. So we had a glorious service. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I get a frantic call from the lady of the house. She said, Pastor, you have got to help me. My son is convinced that Jesus is a zombie. And I said, oh, no. She said, that's not my worst problem. He loves zombies. He is in love with Jesus the zombie. What do I do? (laughs) So (laughs) Alpha is a place where you can come and ask, is Jesus a zombie? And not be laughed at. It's a legitimate question. If you haven't been around church. So that's what, that's, what, that's what Alpha is. It's also a place to get to belong. To find a group of people that you can identify with. That you can belong to. And I anticipate that our Alpha groups may become small groups. That's what has happened with us in the past. So we're going to approach it that way. Yes, ma'am. Would I say a little bit more about the second coming? Uh, well, I, I will say a little bit more. I, this is what I'll say about the second coming. God will get it right. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll say about the second coming. God's going to get it right. I, I will say this, uh, Jan. Um, from Paul, Paul at this point when he read, wrote 1 Thessalonians, he believed he would see the second coming with his own eyes. He believed that. And six months later, when he wrote Second Thessalonians, he believed that. And a couple of years later, when he wrote some of the other books, he believed that. It was only when he began writing to the Philippians and to Timothy, and he believed he was at the end of his life, he began to say, I don't know if I will. He didn't know if he would, but he believed they would. And I will tell you that every generation that had lived since the time of Paul believed it lived in the last days. Every generation, including this generation. There are a lot of folks who believe they live in the last days. And sooner or later, somebody's going to be right. (laughs) Yes, sir. Influence in his writing, uh, he, uh, he writes as, as well, I'll give you a for instance, Rick. Uh, in the book of Corinthians, the, the church at Corinth had a lot of sexual issues. I'm, I'll just leave it at that. They had a lot of sexual issues. And Paul went so far as to say, well, if I had advice to give to you, I'd say don't get married because the days are short. But if you got to, go ahead. It's all right. 
But he, he, it, that, it had that kind of an effect on him. Uh, there was, there's, you're going to hear Paul, there are some of the church, um, I think it's in 2 Thessalonians, where there are some of the church believed so strongly that the second coming was imminent, they stopped working. They stopped working. And Paul says, if a man won't work, neither should he eat. So it had that kind of a, it had that kind of an effect on other folks, but Paul had to, to back them up a little bit and say, look, you've got to continue on. I believe, still believe it's going to be short, but you've got to continue on with life. Okay, a couple of things. There was this preacher who was uh, long-winded. And uh, one Sunday, uh, one of his parishioners got up in the middle of his sermon and left. And right at the end of the sermon, he came back. And uh, the pastor was a little bit irritated, and he said to the man, Now, why did you leave in the middle of my sermon? He said, I, I, needed to, I went to go get a haircut. And the pastor was very irritated by then. He said, Well, why didn't you get a haircut before you came to church? He said, I didn't need one then. <laughs> oh... Most seniors don't get enough exercise. In his wisdom, God decreed that seniors became forgetful. So they would have to search for their glasses, keys, and other things, uh, and thus doing more walking. And God looked down and saw that it was good. Then God saw another need. In his wisdom, he made seniors lose coordination so that they would drop things regularly, uh, and they would have to bend, reach, and stretch. God looked down and saw that it was good. Then God considered the function of bladders and decided seniors would have additional calls of nature requiring more trips to the bathroom, thus providing more exercise. God looked down and saw that it was good. So... If you find as you age you are getting up and down more, remember this, that it is God's will. It is for your best interest, even though you mutter under your breath. The pastor's business card. A new pastor was visiting in the homes of his parishioners. At one house, it seemed obvious that someone was at home. But no one came to his repeated knocks at the door. Therefore, he took out a business card and wrote Revelation 3.20. On the back of it, stuck it in the door. When the offering was uh, processed the following Sunday, he found that his card had been returned. Added to it was the cryptic message, Genesis 3.10. Reaching for his Bible to check out the citation, he broke out in gales of laughter. Revelation 3.20, his passage says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Genesis 3.10, the response was, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid, for I was naked. <laughs> Last but not least... A Saskatchewan farmer and his wife was on their way back home in January or at the airport in Florida awaiting their flight. They are dressed in heavy boots, parka, scarf, mittens, etc., ready for the Canadian winter. An older couple standing nearby is intrigued by their manner of dress. The wife says to the husband, look at that couple. I wonder where they're from. He replies, how would I know? She counters, you could go and ask them. He says, I really don't care. If you want to know, you go and ask them. She decides to do just that and walks over to the couple and asks, Excuse me, looking at your dress, I'm wondering where you're from. The, the farmer replies, uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. 
The woman returns to her husband and asks, So, where are they from? She replies, I don't know. They don't speak English. <laughs> As you go into your world, remember to pray for one another and accept one another in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.